Today I'm finally finishing a project that I started well over two years ago. You know, now is a great time to get all that half-finished stuff done and just get it off your mind. Originally, this was supposed to be a full set of 5.1 surround satellite speakers for my TV, or if you want to call it a home cinema setup, but this project hit so many snags that I ended up just getting, you know, frustrated and, and, and kept putting it off. But I think looking back, each of those snags was actually a chance to learn something and to do it better next time. So what I'm going to do is to first show you the perfect world influencer edit of the process where everything just goes perfectly smoothly on the first try. If that's all that you want to see, that's fine. But after that, I'm going to go through all the learning opportunities that I ran into and show you what I did about them. Okay, so let's start with the speaker design first. These things are satellite speakers, so they're the 5 in 5.1 surround. That means they will only ever do mids and highs, and all the low frequencies will be handled by a subwoofer. In my case, that's this out of place monstrosity that we'll get to later. So by themselves, these speakers will sound incredibly thin, but they only need to be good for things like vocal clarity. The three front satellite speakers are two-way with a four-inch broadband driver and a tweeter for the higher frequencies where larger drivers like this one start to struggle a bit. I'm using fairly cheap Visatone drivers here. The broadband ones are intended as automotive replacement units, but they're actually pretty good overall drivers. For the rear speakers, I'm actually skipping the tweeter. The rear channels really are just an effects channel, and for that the speaker doesn't need to be super duper accurate. I'm using a less powerful and a cheaper driver here, but on the flip side it's a bit better at handling high frequencies without that extra tweeter. One more thing we need for the front speakers is a crossover, which will make sure the tweeter doesn't get destroyed by the low frequency components intended for the mid-range driver, and that broadband mid-range driver isn't responsible for also reproducing the crisp high frequencies. The software Visatone provides for designing speakers actually has a really nice feature where it can incrementally optimize a crossover circuit to your specification. So I actually cheated a bit and designed a crossover that also tweaks the frequency response a bit. Basically makes the overall speaker sound a bit better with the same drivers. The other big factor that goes into how well a particular speaker does with the low end is how big the enclosure is, especially for, you know, sealed enclosures without a port. I knew how physically large I wanted my speakers to be at the most, and I knew that I wanted them to be a bit better at handling low frequencies than my old ones so that I could set the crossover frequency where the subwoofer takes over just a bit lower. Um, and that helps to tie the sound together a bit more nicely. Anyways, that's the acoustic design done. If you're interested in learning more about that, uh, I can really recommend Hexibase here on YouTube. Uh, he really understands this stuff a lot better than I do, and also does a great job of explaining it. And of course he also does some pretty nice 3D printed speakers. Okay, so the rest to this design really just boils down to making a box. A rather complicated box though. So we need the box, or more accurately the enclosure, to do a few things. First, 
it needs to look good. It's always going to be in view. If I just wanted a, a square wooden box, I'd stick with my old speakers or just glue together a few strips of MDF. But I made this, obviously. Next, it needs to be airtight, and it also needs to be rigid enough to resist the pressure difference our drivers are creating inside the box to the outside atmospheric pressure. Then we also need a way to electrically connect the speaker, and lastly, I want it to be slim enough to fit in front of my TV without blocking it. And of course, we also need a way to mount the drivers. So this is what I came up with. It's a main body with the baffle glued in, on the front right there, that's the baffle by itself. And then it has a printed speaker grill that's magnetically held on and has this backer piece to stretch some fabric over the front. Overall, I'm actually really happy with how everything looks once it comes together. It may look similar to a certain device from Google, but as always, uh, any resemblance to other speakers past or present is, is purely coincidental. One good idea before you commit to any major project is to make yourself a prototype to see if everything works and fits as expected. I actually made two of those. The first one you saw sitting right here at half scale, just to see how it would look, including a like little... There we go. Including a little tiny versions of the drivers um, that I was going to be using. And, you know, that turned out really well, and it lasted until just now. Um, I also made the cover and just tried to see how that would look and fit, and it was all good. Uh, I also tried whether I was going to be able to smooth out and finish the surface, and it looked like that was doable, at least. Then I also made a second prototype at full scale to see whether um, it would still fit, everything would still fit together, and whether the simulated sound would match up with uh, what it would actually do, and I was actually really happy with it. One thing you can see with this enclosure already is that I changed it from printing uh, the rear enclosure in one piece to having the rear as a glued-in insert. These parts were all printed on the Atom 2.5 EX, which is a Delta printer with a 2-in-1 multiplexing hotend. So the idea was to print with PLA, since that is a material that I can easily glue and paint, and then have the necessary support material, yeah, like that, uh, with an interface layer of PVA so that I could just dunk the parts in water and get a perfect surface. It still made sense to save material and print time though, so instead of having the entire enclosure filled with support material, um, I thought I'd rather fill in any gaps on the outside that a glued-in rear cover would create. For some reason, printing the enclosure the other way around wasn't something I considered. I think it's because even with soluble supports, super shallow overhangs like these tend to print pretty horribly, and I guess I thought that would be too much work to clean up. But before we can even get to the finishing process, there's the printing process itself, which was an absolute pain. PVA plus PLA in the same nozzle is not a great look. It works for a while, but at least on the Atom 2.5EX it was just incredibly unreliable. I think I ended up printing each part, you know, at least three times, there's a few of the scraps that I kept around, uh, just to get a single successful print out of it, and that was already with pampering the PVA, like keeping it as dry as possible and printing at lower temperatures for the PLA, etc. Thing is, at the time, this was two years ago, slicers didn't support multi-material as well as they do now, so I had to pull quite a few tricks on the G-code uh, for the switchover to even get it working at all. The color scheme that I settled on for the finished speakers was uh, a painted white surface, actually I think this one is, is nice to show, Filamentum's gold happens for the baffle, which I intentionally designed so that it would be visible as a strip, and a grey fabric for the grill. This is Protopasta t-shirt gray, which I actually like for the look. But also, it's actually one of the softest and stretchiest t-shirts I had, which makes it perfect for wrapping it around that grill. Protopasta, I hope you guys forgive me for cutting up your t-shirt. Yeah. Now, right off the printer, the main enclosure... Yeah! Right there and the grill were actually supported parts, so they obviously still had some bits of uh, PVA stuck to them. Even though peeling away the support material turned out to be pretty easy. I dunked all the parts into a bucket of warm water to help the PVA dissolve, but that was a pretty big mistake. 
So the problem is when air warms up, it expands, but as it cools down, obviously it also contracts again. So as I left the part sitting in there, submerged, everything just started to cool off and water got sucked into these parts through all the little crevices uh, that any filament print just naturally has. Which meant that I definitely couldn't move on to painting and finishing these parts with them still being half filled with water. So I drilled a few small holes, you can actually see these on all the parts that I still have, um, and set them out in the sun to dry. And that was mistake number two. I mean, I should have seen this coming, but uh, even in the cooler springtime sun, the PLA still heated up way too much and started warping, so that left me with a bunch of deformed parts where nothing fit together. Oh well, more printing it was then. For joining the two parts of the enclosure, I tried a few different adhesives, including solvent welding, but I had the best results with some regular old epoxy. Okay, next challenge, getting a smooth surface. The rear body is supposed to look like it's a single continuous surface, so I had to do some fillering and some sanding before I could even paint it. What I ended up liking the most was this green 1K nitrous filler, which dries quickly and was really easy to sand. I also tried 2K automotive filler, which wasn't as easy to apply, as well as 2K epoxy filler primer that's usually used for spraying on, but just like the epoxy resin itself, it actually ends up quite hard and then takes a lot of effort to sand smooth. I also thought I had bought a bunch of filler primer in cans, but actually the stuff I got was only primer, so without the filler part. With that, it was really hard to get a good coat onto the parts that would hide layer lines and flaws. So yeah, with a bunch of back and forth between sanding and applying more filler, then spraying primer, paint, sanding out flaws, painting again, and in the end, adding a clear coat, these parts do look okay. They're not perfect and painting them indoors where you don't get insects stuck to or pooping onto your parts uh, when they're freshly painted, that would have helped a lot too. So even getting that far to having a, a bunch of raw parts had been a huge pile of frustration and I just needed a break from the project. But that break ended up being two years long. You know how that goes. But thankfully all that was left to do was to assemble everything. And here's where it got really hairy. Nothing fit together. Well, a few things did, but for example the speaker grill just did not match up with the body and the baffle and it still doesn't, like it still looks off. It almost looked like they didn't even have the same basic geometry, the same basic shape. And it's the same with the grill and that inside clamping part uh, where it looks like the two top indents for the magnets are way closer together than the bottom ones. But I knew that everything should fit, after all it was modeled to match up perfectly and it was all sliced with the same profiles and all. But then it dawned on me. These parts were all printed on the Atom, which is a Delta printer. So what happens when a Delta printer is not perfectly calibrated is that you know, some dimensions may just look fine if you print, for example, a simple test stick, but parts will be distorted in a really weird way. Here's what the print envelope looks like for a delta. Now, if it's miscalibrated, here's what I believe happens to that geometry. And if you try to print something rectangular, each corner of that rectangle is going to get distorted differently. So some parts actually fit together well because they were printed in the same orientation, but others just did not match up because they were printed flat with different sides facing up on the printer, or they were even just rotated on the bit. I think that exact issue with fitment was what, you know, put the final nail in the coffin to make me shelf this project back then. But okay, I definitely didn't want to reprint everything, and because I had rearranged my living room in the meantime, and I'm also thinking about building some floor standing speakers instead of the left and right satellite speakers, and also getting rid of the subwoofer, I only needed one of those front speakers and the two rear surround units, so I went ahead and built them as best as I could. I still had my translucent prototype assembled and started by grabbing the crossover and tweeter from that one. The paper cone in the broadband speaker got a bit dinged up so I grabbed a new one. Uh, these are only a few bucks and I can always use the old one in a fun project where that damage doesn't really matter. The baffles for the center and rear speakers each got a pair of alignment pins glued in, as well as four magnets to hold the speaker grill in place. 
Gluing in magnets is actually surprisingly tricky. I've had cases where the magnet one hole over uh, would pull out another one out of its recess. But with those in place, I could mount the drivers, hook up the crossover, connectors and drivers, and glue the gold baffles into the white enclosures. I used gap filling super glue here, epoxy would also work really well, and maybe fill any gaps even better. So at that point, the speakers are actually fully functional. So I gave them a quick test and they sounded as expected, but not finished yet. Now the cloth covering actually turned out to be my favorite part of all of this. I think it turned out really well, but the process also wasn't hard at all. To start, I cut the fabric to rough size, then wrapped it around the grill and pulled it through the backer piece. Then I'd slightly stretch the fabric in one direction and tack it down with some thin super glue on one edge. And after making sure the fabric's pattern was looking good on the front, I could also tack the opposite edge. The corners need a bit of tucking, but at this point, the backer piece actually holds the fabric in place enough so that it can work it until it looks good without it sliding back out. And some super glue all around fixes it in place permanently. The only tricky bit here is not using too much super glue, because if you glob on too much, it will soak into the visible area and leave a hard stain. I did that on one spot. I'm actually having trouble finding that. I think it's around here somewhere. Um, but yeah, as you can see, the, the fabric does hide that pretty well. It's important to use thin, fresh super glue for this because it needs to seep through the fabric and uh, you know bond both the fabric to the main grill and to the back of frame. But yeah, overall, this is a, a really neat technique that's super easy to do and just adds a lot of warmth and appeal to any 3D printed part, I think. This does look good, right? But back to the speakers. With the grills on, these are now done. So how do they look and how do they sound? Let's start with looks. Here's what a left, center and right speaker would look like. And I think that's actually not too bad. Like I said though, I think I'll go with floor standing speakers to the left and right here. So for now, I'll only have that one center speaker and that unfortunately looks kind of lost. In the future, I might build a soundbar style center speaker instead. But the rear speakers fit in really well. Now for sound, like I said, these are not meant to be listened to without a subwoofer. So once we add that subwoofer, it's really decent. I'm not going to tell you these are the greatest audiophile grade speakers in the world because they are certainly not, but in combination with a subwoofer, they're great for watching Netflix with surround sound, listening to music, and what I use my TV for most, watching YouTube. But the best thing about them is all the stuff I learned along the way. This project was actually the uh, inspiration for the resin finishing video, and that is a technique that I would absolutely use again to get a perfect finish on something like this loudspeaker set. I've also learned that it's not that hard to make things that look, you know, better than just a square box with cutouts. The finishing definitely took a while for these particular speakers, but you know, even without that, printed in like a matte white or something, I think these would still look good. So before we go, I want to point out something you can do right now to help push against the current pandemic if you have a 3D printer. Get organized. Almost every country has some community that's already organizing and distributing equipment, you can make with your own 3D printer. Obviously, face shields is the big one right now. Even if you can only make the 3D printed parts and not the transparent shield itself, you can still help. Here in Germany, we have makersvsvirus.org, where you can register if you can produce or are a medical institution in need of equipment. In the US, for example, matter hackers are organizing equipment distribution. So have a look at how you can help. CNC Kitchen, 3D Maker Noob, and 3D Printing Nerd all have videos up on how to quickly and effectively print them. So check them out. Thanks a lot for that. And as always, thank you for watching. Keep on making, probably more important now than ever. Wash your hands and I'll see you in the next one.